If you will allow me to take a moment of personal privilege before I begin the message proper, I, I, I do feel like David said in my favorite Psalm, Psalm 118, this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. I, I have to just say a few words of thanks to many who made this possible, and it is impossible to do this adequately. But uh, I want to thank my, my colleagues and students at Southern Seminary. Uh, Southern Seminary has allowed me to do this. Dr. and Mrs. Moeller were here a few weeks ago. Uh, it just... The fact that both places where the Lord placed me uh, believed in the other place and the mission that God gave them. And it's just been remarkable that I have gotten to serve such an incredible institution as Southern Seminary on behalf of the churches of the Southern Baptist Convention while sim simultaneously leading one of the Lord's churches such as Buck Run. And I, 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 I see so many of my colleagues whom I just love and cherish here today, others have, have just been so encouraging. Thank you. I want to thank my mother. My mom is here, 91 years old, still feisty, still dresses pretty flashy. Uh, uh, I just have to say, Mom, and I mean this from the bottom of my, of my heart, without you, none of this would be possible. Uh, thank my sisters and their families for being here today, my wonderful brothers-in-law. Uh, Buck Run, uh, the series of dinners and lunches and all that we had this week still proved so inadequate for me to get to talk to all of you or you to me. And I, I, I look forward to heaven because only there are we really going to have unending time to just talk about the things of the Lord but, uh, man, how I love you and thank you. And I'll say more to you tonight. I want to thank my sons, uh, both of them remarkable men, both of them with impeccable taste in women. Uh, I love my daughters-in-law and my grandchildren just to have made serving the Lord uh, a joy. I, I was thinking, you know, man, it's, uh, it's fitting, Michael, is a pastor in Ashland, and Michael is here. I'll never forget my first Sunday as pastor uh, of the First Baptist Church in Marion, Arkansas. And Tanya had fallen and hurt her, her uh, how do I say this delicate, her tailbone. There, that's not good, but it, it's the truth. And couldn't really negotiate stairs very well. But, but they, at First Baptist Marion, Arkansas, there on the Arkansas Delta, that church had a rickety little elevator. And it was just big enough for really a wheelchair, but it kept Tiny from, the, the sanctuary was upstairs. And man, I'm the new pastor, and I was really wanting to, you know, impress these people that I was going to be a good pastor. And uh, we got there to the church, and one of the deacons, Larry Fowler, met us there. And I told, I told Michael, I said, you going upstairs to the sanctuary with, with uh, Brother Fowler here, and Mom and I are going to ride the uh, elevator. He said, I want to ride the elevator. I said, no, there's not room. It's a tiny little thing. Just go with Brother Fowler. I want to ride the elevator. I said, Michael, do not argue with me. Go with Brother Fowler. We will meet you upstairs. So this Ricky O elevator, I mean, Michael and Larry Fowler beat us to the next floor well before we got there. We opened the door and Michael and Larry Fowler are standing there. I mean, Michael was five years old and he's standing there. And I just thought, you know, I mean, he was not looking happy. I said, Michael, do you know why I'm so mean to you? He said, yeah, because you hate children and you're not my real father. <laughs> Five years old. That's the lip I got from that kid. So it's only fitting you're here to some way embarrass me on this day too, I'm sure. But uh, I have 
it is just a, man, I'm so proud of my sons. Tanya and I raised men, and I'm proud of them. They're men of God, serving the Lord, and I am just grateful to the Lord for them. And then, again, I'll say more tonight, my wife. Wow. If you want to, yeah, absolutely. If you want to know what effective gospel ministry and Christian influence look like, look at Tanya York. Because her life preaches the gospel like no one else I know. And it is an honor to go through life with you and to serve Jesus with you. And I could not do what I do without you by my side. She's remarkable. And I just thank God for you. Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. It is fitting to end on a note of praise and glory, isn't it? It was fitting for Paul to end the epistle this way. It's fitting for us to end my tenure at Buck Run that way. Uh, and, you know, Paul I, was given to doxologies. Uh, if I'm counting correctly, I think there are four, uh, excuse me, there are 20 passages in the New Testament that we consider doxologies, these ascriptions of praise and honor to God. And Four of the 20 are in the book of Romans. Uh, throughout the book, Paul has had to just stop for a moment and just praise the Lord. Even in chapter 1, when he was talking about God's wrath, and those who worship the, the creation more than the creator, he stopped to say the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. In chapter 9, in verse 5, when he speaks of Christ and his sovereignty, he said, the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. And when he concludes chapter 11, we talk about how the first 11 chapters of, of Romans are really the doctrine, and then chapters 12 through 15 are the duty. But it's not quite so simple. They're at the, the hinge between those two parts, Paul has to stop for just a moment, and he just has to praise God. Between the doctrine and the duty, there's got to be a moment of praise. But there has to be doxology after the theology. And he says, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments. How inscrutable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who has been his counselor? Who has given a gift to him that he might be repaid? For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And now Paul comes to the end of his epistle. He has laid out the, what the gospel is. He has carefully defined it. He has shown them how God has made one people from Jews and Gentiles, from people all over the world. He's made us the one people of God. And he has to stop and conclude this letter with an inscription of praise to the one who has done this. Now, don't lose sight that Romans 16, the very end of the book, is much like Romans 1. 
that the conclusion has the same themes as the introduction. If you look back at chapter one and you read it, you'll hear the very same themes that I just read to you from verses 25, 26, and 27 in his greeting. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. Now, after this incredible epistle, this explanation of the gospel, doctrine becomes doxology. Theological points become personal praise as he reminds the church at Rome that we're one, that both Jew and Gentile, God has put us together to make us one people, a covenant people, and our sole purpose is to bring glory to him. Why did he make us one? To praise him, to glorify him. You know the catechism, the chief end of man is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Not only in eternity, but right now. And this is why Paul says, now to him who is able to strengthen you. Oh, I like that. Praise God that he strengthens us. Now, Paul knows that the church at Rome is going to need strength. He knows that they are facing perilous times, that persecution lies ahead. I mean, we know that Paul's own life will end there in Rome, that he is going to be martyred for the faith. He knows what's coming, but he says that he will strengthen you. Oh, praise God he strengthens us because this is exactly what he said in chapter one. Remember this, I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God to salvation. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. And not only is it the, the gospel, the, the power of God to salvation, it's the power of God in salvation. It's the power of God to save, and it's the power of God to strengthen. Now, this word that Paul uses here, he's able to him who's able to strengthen you, is the word that is used often of, of strengthening the churches. When Luke uses this word in the Acts, when Paul would go back to some church that he had planted in order to strengthen them. This is the prayer that God will strengthen and settle you. It's the word used for nurturing new believers or strengthening young churches. Paul knows how weak we are. We, we are so weak. How weak were we? Well, we were dead. You don't get much weaker than a dead man. We were dead in trespasses and sins, but God raised us up together in Christ. And Paul has told us earlier in this epistle that while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. I mean, this has been Paul's theme. You can't save yourself. You can't keep the law. If you're trying to save yourself by the law, you only have condemnation. You'll only fail. The only thing that awaits you is separation from God. But Jesus did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He became our righteousness. And so while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. Oh, praise him who's able to strengthen you, not just for the new birth, but for the new life. I mean, the gospel that saved us is the gospel that sanctifies us. We must never see salvation as an event that occurred somewhere where we made a decision or walked an aisle and, and that's that. No, salvation 
is God's continuing work in us. Yes, I was saved as a seven-year-old boy, but I am being saved day by day. I will be saved finally when I go to be with Jesus. And God is continuing to work. It's still his power in every bit of it. We're, we're not saved by his power and then kept by ours. We're not, we're not born again by his power, but then sanctified by ours. It is the power of God that strengthens us in salvation and in sanctification. And praise God that he strengthens us. Did you notice this little word according in those three verses? There at the end of Romans 16, he says, now to him who's able to strengthen you, and then you'll find that according to three times, according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Now I love this, according to my gospel. God strengthens us through proclamation. According to my gospel, do you know that the gospel is yours? The, the gospel is mine. Why? Because I possess Christ. Not in the sense that I am master of it, but it's mine. Now, my family will tell you I'm not much of a cook, but there are a few things that I do and do very well. And my daughters-in-law, my grandkids, my sons, they all say, oh, if they want eggs, they ask Papa to make eggs. Papa's eggs. Papa's chili and Papa's egg salad. Now, I used to go to, when uh, we still had extension centers, we had, uh, Southern had one up in New York, and I would go up every weekend. And right by the hotel where I stayed uh, in Manhattan, there was a, a, an Asian deli, and I would go in there, and I, I began to see their egg salad, and their egg salad was just remarkable. You know, it's too many people, like they almost puree their egg salad. It's, I don't want some homogenous paste, <laughs> right? Uh, what I noticed about this is that they, they cut the eggs up into big pieces. And it, it looked pretty simple. Like, what are the ingredients in this? And I asked the guy, I mean, I ate this egg salad. It was delicious. I said, what's in this? He said, eggs and mayonnaise and salt and pepper. I said, you're kidding. He, I said, uh, like, can I make that? He said, yeah, chop up the eggs. And he told me, don't, don't chop them into little pieces. Leave them big pieces so every bite is different. And mix it up, get your mayonnaise and just mix it up. I said, well, how much mayonnaise do I put in? He said, you'll know. <laughs> I have never once used any kind of measurement with my egg salad. I can do it with any number of eggs, and I do it only with Duke's mayonnaise. Duke's is by far the best. It's got a tang to it that I like. And so I chop up those eggs, I put in my Duke's, coarse salt and pepper, and it's delicious. Now, there's nothing in that that I made. I didn't lay the egg. I've laid a few in this pulpit, but I didn't lay those. <laughs> I didn't lay the eggs. I didn't make the mayonnaise. I didn't generate salt or pepper. But it's my egg salad. Because I took it. I use it. I serve it. I enjoy it. Man, the gospel is mine. Jesus died for me. He gave me life. He gave me strength. When we say this is my gospel, we're not taking anything away from Jesus. We're acknowledging what he's done for us. Now to him who's able to strengthen you according to my gospel. The gospel is mine because I possess Christ and the gospel is preached because I proclaim Christ and the preaching of Jesus Christ. It was, I believe, in May of uh, 2015 that the members of Buck Run came out here in an open field 
and we had traced on the ground the perimeter of this building. And our members lined up on that perimeter. And there was an X marked right in the middle on this very spot. And with all of our members standing around the perimeter of what would become this building, I stood on the very spot that became this pulpit and we prayed. We faced in and we prayed for what God would do in this building, what God would do in this pulpit. And then we turned and faced out what God would do from this place to the nations. And if you look at any aerial photos of this building, you'll notice one thing, that all sight lines on this property converge on this spot. That what is at the very heart and center of Buckland Baptist Church is the preaching of the word. Oh, it does not matter who's behind here so long it is, as it is a God-called servant of the Lord. What matters is who is preached and what is preached. And this gospel is proclaimed from this pulpit. Beneath these walls are steel beams with hundreds of scriptures, texts that have been written on them by the members of this church. Because we wanted to say that underneath everything you see about this place, what undergirds it is the word of God. Now to him who's able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ. Oh, I thank God that this is a pulpit that only preaches Christ. Buck Run isn't departing from the word, deleting the difficult, or deconstructing the faith. This pulpit will continue to herald the good news, to proclaim the truth, to preach the word, to present the gospel, to exposit the text. This pulpit will preach Christ and him crucified because in the gospel of God, the righteousness of Christ is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That's what this pulpit has been preaching since 1818. And by the grace of God, we'll continue on. I'll tell you, I pray two things for Chris. I pray that he will preach in this pulpit faithfully until Jesus comes. And I pray that he gets a tenure of one day. <laughs> because I would love for Jesus to come tomorrow. Oh, how I don't know when Christ is coming, but I know this. I want this pulpit to be proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ. Praise God that he strengthens us by his gospel, that he strengthens us by revelation. Paul says that this strength is according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed. See, we don't recognize the gospel by our reasoning. We would never come up with this. If it were up to us, we'd devise something where God set some kind of a a goal out there that we have to attain, some standard that we have to achieve, some acts that we have to commit. And of course, we would make ourselves the judges of whether or not we achieved it. That's, that would be our plan. But God came and he said, no, my standard is perfect righteousness, but you could never achieve perfect righteousness. In fact, you're too late. You can't do it. You've already sinned. So I will achieve perfect righteousness for you. And he sent the Lord Jesus Christ to keep the law on our behalf. We, we could never reason that out. We didn't receive that through our reason. We received it by revelation. And this is what Paul says. This is a mystery that was kept secret for long ages. Now, when you see this word mystery, especially in the epistles of Paul, it has an almost technical meaning. It means something that was previously hidden, but now through what Christ has done, it has been fully revealed. 
So we get glimpses of Christ in the Old Testament, like in the Passover, uh, in David, the king. I mean, we, we see these types of Christ that are in the Old Testament, but it's hard to put it all together until we come to the revelation of Jesus in the new. And now we have the, the Holy Spirit's word in the New Testament, and we say, oh, there it is. Now that which was hidden has been revealed. When you read the Old Testament, you see glimpses, you see little snippets about, well, the gospel, the, the, God is going to work among all the nations, and my house is going to be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And you see that. But it really looks like he's working with just one group of people, the descendants of Abraham. But you come to the New Testament and you go, oh, no, it's for all the nations. It's for everybody. It's for the whole world. What was previously hidden has now been revealed. And this is what Paul says the gospel is. It's God's full revelation of his will for the world through Jesus Christ, that he's called upon all men everywhere to repent and to believe. And since it has been disclosed, the word Paul uses, it has to be made known. That's where we come in. That we are to make him known to the nations. This is what Jesus gave us in the Great Commission. Praise God that he strengthens us by evangelization. He says, according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. This is, these prophetic writings have been made known to all nations. We make him known. We don't keep this to ourselves. We're not gathered in some back room, you know, like, oh, let's not offend anybody. Let, 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 you know, let's let everybody have their own truth. No, we're here to proclaim to all the world that Jesus is Lord and that whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. We want to make him known. And we do it through the scriptures. This is what Paul reminds us. Through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations. The only other time in the New Testament you see the Bible called that is in, in 2 Peter. Uh, in chapter 1, verse 19, Peter refers to uh, the, the scriptures as the prophetic writings, and he even puts Paul's epistles in that category. And what Paul is saying is that the Holy Spirit has given us his word. We have a book, and this is what we preach. It has been my honor to preach from this pulpit and to preach the word to you so our view of preaching, it's not like we're not just searching for sermons. We're not looking for little snippets. We're not lifting something out to prove a point. What are we doing? We're looking at every book in its context, every passage in its context. We're looking for what the author intended by that. We're looking at how the, the Bible itself interprets itself. We're looking for context because context is... You knew I had to say it. <laughs> Context is everything. And we preach the scriptures in the way God gave them to us. And we do it by his command. He says, according to the command of the eternal God. This is what God has given us to do. We're commanded to call upon people to repent and believe. It's what Paul here calls the obedience of faith. It's the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. Now, is that an objective or a subjective genitive? In other words, is, is the obedience faith itself or does faith then generate that obedience? And the answer is yes. Both things are true. Faith is the obedience. You cannot obey God without believing the gospel. You must believe. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. So faith is the obedience. 
But as James tells us, a faith that does not work is a dead faith. Faith brings obedience. You may not be as smart as some, but you can be as obedient as any Christian who ever lived. You may not have the gifts that some others have, but you can be as devoted to Christ and as surrendered to the Holy Spirit as any Christian who ever lived. You may not have someone else's talent, but you can have as much character, as much obedience as anyone. And that is what God has called us to do. It's the command of the eternal God to bring about obedience of faith. I have done my best to hear be clear about the moral imperatives of Scripture and the standards that Scripture has set, but also to, to make sure that we all understand that even our obedience is a, is a grace of God. That it's not some slavish commitment to a list of rules and regulations, and this is how we gauge uh, that we're good Christians because we do this or don't do this. It's because we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and because we have fallen in love with him and because we love him, we want to be like him. And the closer we draw to him, the more we read his word, the more we surrender to his Holy Spirit, the more he does a work in our lives to make us look like our Savior. Uh, I've, uh, years ago, I, I read in a book by J. Sidlow Baxter, one of my favorite writers, a poem that uh, a, a woman wrote for her pastor. Her name was Beatrice Cleland. And I've really, tr I've really tried to live by what she wrote of her pastor. Not only by the words you say, not only in your deeds confessed, but in the most unconscious way is Christ expressed. For me, it was not the truth you taught to you so clear, to me so dim. But when you came to me, you brought a sense of him. And from your eyes, he beckons me. And from your lips, his love is shed. Till I lose sight of you and see the Christ instead. Oh, is that not what we want? To love Christ so passionately, so dearly, that we become more and more like him? So that when we're at work, when we're with family, when we're on vacation, that people sense an aroma, a fragrance of Jesus about us. Oh, this is the obedience of faith. This is how the world will be won. You're not going to argue anybody into the kingdom of God. You're not going to intellectually pin them and make them admit that some particular thing is sin. You just have to show them the truth of the word of God in your life. You have to be like Jesus. And this is how the nations are going to be reached. Paul says this is a According to the eternal command. This is according to the command of the eternal God for all nations. Th this is our commitment to help all nations know Jesus so that he receives the glory due his name. My, the Lord has been so faithful to Buck Run. Imagine. Uh, that in the 1990s, a tiny little mission begins out of this church, the Romanian American mission, that today over 400 churches have been planted because of that audacious dream that God put in Brother Bob's heart. Uh, I, yesterday, our dear friends in Manaus, Penny Hatcher, sent me a picture of them, their children's workers' training session. And you know how many children's workers they had yesterday show up for training? About 1,200. That's their children's workers. And you know what? They were sitting on benches, pews made by people at Buck Run. You know, uh, when we went down there, we, we couldn't speak Portuguese. 
what we could do was we could be a team that did things that would enable them who know the gospel to reach people. So we come along and support. Buck Run has done that, whether we're the ones proclaiming or we're the ones supporting, whether it's in whatever part of the world we've gone to, Brazil, Romania, Panama, the Colombian border down there. I, it, it just our people have gone with remarkable surrender to say, we just want the nations to know Christ and to honor him. This is the heart of Paul. This is how he concludes Romans, that he didn't share with us this great epistle and this great gospel truth for us to keep it to ourselves. But he gave it to us so that we might give it out. And if we really get it, if we really understand the gospel, well, we can't just sit there like a knot on a log. We, we can't just be quiet. We can't just go home unmoved and unchanged. The gospel gets down to our very core. It changes our priorities. It changes the way we live. It changes the way we spend our money, the way we treat our wives, the way we, we, we do our jobs. All theology must result in doxology. We become so moved, so filled with gospel truth that it's just got to come out in our behavior and in our words. Right thinking about God always leads to right worship of God. And if you aren't moved to doxology, you really don't understand theology. Oh, God, preserve us from being a church that wants to talk about the peccability or impeccability of Christ, but won't walk across the street to tell a lost man the gospel. God, protect us from ever being so filled in our head, but so empty in our hearts that we lose a passion to see the lost come to Christ. How can you speak of salvation without contemplating the glory of God? I mean, this is the purpose for which he saved you. Human intellect has to surrender, has to yield to divine wisdom. This is why if you look at this doxology, Paul begins with, now to him. I mean, he never gets to that part you expect in a doxology, to him be. Did you notice that? Oh, to him. He says, to him who? And he's got to talk about the who for a long time, who Jesus is, what he has done. But now he comes back to his original thought. Oh, as I was saying, to him, the only wise God, the wisdom of God is the only wisdom that matters. And we live in a world that wants to absolutely ridicule and reject our gospel. I just want to encourage you, stay true to the word of God. Let God be true and every man a liar. Do not be bothered. Don't be intimidated. Don't be angry at lost people for acting like lost people. But cling to the word of God. Surrender your intellect to God's wisdom. Uh, Paul has already said this back in chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. You, you can't figure God out. You can't reason him out so that it's going to make sense to your little human mind. You've just got to say, Lord... I'm going to trust that you have revealed yourself fully in Jesus Christ and in your word, and I know everything I need to know. I have everything I need for life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called us to glory and virtue so that by these exceeding great and precious promises, I can escape the corruption that's in the world through lust. That is my desire, and I'm going to trust your wisdom that God would save you apart from any righteousness of yours. That, that just doesn't make sense to our human minds. We think that 
Oh, you know, if you work hard, you get rewarded for your work, that you get what you achieve, that you get blessing based on your accomplishments. But Paul has just spent this entire epistle telling us, no, you get blessed based on Jesus' accomplishment. You get rewarded for his work. That when you go to heaven, you won't put your thumbs underneath your lapel and say, look what I did. You're going to say, now to him. To him who was able to strengthen me according to my gospel. Oh, the divine wisdom that would not just save you, but keep you apart from any works of yours. That God would be glorified in saving you from your sin instead of leaving you in it. I, I, I just can't help but plead with anyone that might be here today who has never put your faith and trust in Jesus. If it would help, I would get on my knees and beg you to trust Christ that you might come to Jesus as you are and, and in your weakness, in the deadness of your trespasses and sins and just say, I believe your word. I believe you loved me so much that you went to Calvary's cross for me. I believe that you rose from the grave for me. I believe that you love me enough to give me salvation. And today I'm calling on your name for salvation, repenting of my sin, letting go of any of my own deeds and self-righteousness. Today I'm putting my faith and trust in Jesus alone. Oh, oh, that that might happen. That there might be someone here listening to my voice who would say, yes. That's what I want. I want Jesus. I'm letting go of everything else. I'm saying to him who's able to strengthen me, I'm making the gospel my own. I'm receiving it by faith. Today, I'm inviting you to come to Jesus. In a few moments, we're going to sing. And when we do, I'll, I'm inviting you to come take one of these pastors by the hand and say, yes, today I'm trusting Christ. This, you want to see this place go nuts? You want to see this place just erupt? You, you just let this, this crowd see someone turn to faith in Jesus. And man, there will be rejoicing. You talk about a greater event than the retirement of an old preacher. It's when a sinner repents and comes to faith in Jesus. And that is what we pray for. That is what we long for. But you know, salvation... God's salvation, just like God's glory, comes only one way. Notice the last words of this epistle. Through Jesus Christ. Oh, to him, the only wise God, be glory forevermore. But that glory will be through Jesus Christ. You know, all worship of the Father has to be through the Son. Has to be. There's no other way to get to the Father except through the Son. And, and the epistle that began grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ ends with to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. No greater privilege. No higher honor. No more precious gift than to bring glory to Jesus Christ. Is that what you want? Because that is the job of the Holy Spirit. And if you will surrender every desire in your life to that one to bring glory to Jesus Christ, you will see the Holy Spirit do amazing things in your life. Because when you say, more than anything else, I just want to glorify him, that's when the Holy Spirit says, I will help you do that. There is no circumstance in which the Holy Spirit will say no to that prayer. At the end of uh, To Kill a Mockingbird, the lawyer Atticus Finch has stood for justice 
and goodness in defending Tom Robinson, a black man falsely accused of rape. At the very end of that movie, the trial is over. Everyone walks out of the courtroom down there on the floor. Atticus Finch is closing up his briefcase, gathering his papers. But all the black folk up in the balcony who have been relegated to that place to watch the trial, they've remained. And they silently stand up while Atticus Finch below them begins to walk out. The story is told through the perspective of Atticus's daughter. She goes by the name Scout, but her real name is Jean Louise. And as these black folk recognizing what Atticus Finch has done, silently stand in his honor, she's watching it through the, uh, the, the rails there. And Reverend Sykes leans down to her, calls her by her proper name always, Miss Jean Louise. Miss Jean Louise, stand up. Your father's passing by. Dear church, you have cared for me, protected me, heeded me, held me, and honored me. But I'm only the man pointing you to Jesus, saying, Buck Ron, Buck Ron, stand up. Your Savior is passing by. Now to him, to him who's able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God, be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.